I'm going to start to record and you should probably get notice on your computers if you're okay. <clears throat> so it's recording. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> so the so I will try to kind of uh, lead the teacher panel, but feel free to talk about anything. And also, you know, for those who are listening, uh, feel free to type in questions or raise your hand um, in Zoom. The first is, why do you decide to become a teacher? Um, <laughs> I, I can start. Um, I, 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 I grew up in San Bernardino. I went to Pacific High School and I um, went to Cal State uh, and I, I, got, I, I majored in chemistry. And in college, you know, I was looking for a job and fortunately uh, my old AVID teacher requested that I return as an AVID tutor. And so when I was there, I started to um, see how many students I could empathize with because we were both, you know, first generation students and um, I realized how um, impactful my teachers were in my decisions that I made to go to school, major in science. And so I decided I wanted to, to pay it forward because there were so many other students that, that I could relate to um, as I was working there. And so because I was an avid tutor and I got to experience that um, working with students, I, I decided to uh, become a teacher. And um, I, right after I got my my degree, um, I actually got hired as an emergency credential, so that was really exciting. And I started my my uh, credential program at Cal State right away, and um, it was it was really crazy time, but it was all worth it. And um, yeah, so for me, it was it was just the motivation of, of paying it forward and seeing how just education or the decisions I made to to pursue a, a degree really changed my life and how much so many other kids need that same guidance that I received from my teachers that made it worthwhile for me to, to also pay it forward. Thank you. Anyone else want to share? Um, Dr. Yin, this is Veronica again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so as a child, I was bossy, plain and simple always playing the teacher with all the neighborhood kids, always um, trying to tutor kids that were older than me. And so it was just a good fit. Initially, I thought I was going to be a special ed teacher and freaked out over the amount of paperwork. And then I thought I was gonna be an elementary teacher and by fluke happenstance of clicking an extra box on my application for um, Fontana Unified, uh, apparently I had the extra box I clicked was for middle school and that's what I got hired as um, as a paid intern so I was like well I could start now and start making money and I got put into an eighth grade math science class with a multiple subject credential loved it and I haven't left middle school since great uh, for me um, I was going to school to be an eye doctor, an optometrist. That was my goal, of course. Uh, thinking like, okay, I'm gonna make a lot of money, I'm gonna be a doctor, but not have to do all those years. Uh, but then I went on a trip with the church that I was working at um, to go uh, help rebuild houses from Hurricane Katrina. And so I was working there with a bunch of high school kids. I was in college, and the person that was leading it was a principal at a private school. And he saw how I was working with the kids and, you know, said, hey, have you ever thought about going into teaching? And it, basically the whole plane ride home, I kept thinking about that and really looking into that. And then when I got back, I changed my uh, focus. I was still, you know, still science and everything like that, but um, went into teaching, getting my credential, um, and then was offered, I wanted to go into high school, of course, and then I was offered a position over at Curtis and had not left yet and don't plan to at any time soon. Uh, I did science first and then I transitioned into STEM and engineering pathway. Thank you. Um, and for me, when I was in high school and middle school, um, I had a lot of great teachers that really made a difference in my life and not just, you know, teaching the particular subject area, but 
just, you know, as a human being, just being there for you. And then I also had a lot of teachers that weren't so great and they made life miserable. It was horrible. Um, so I was always interested in science. So when I went to college, I majored in biology and I had ideas of maybe going into research or being a forensic scientist. And I kind of thought about teaching. And then I, one of my professors gave me a flyer for the Noyce Scholarship Program. Uh, for science and math teachers at Cal State. And that kind of got me to thinking and thinking back on all my, my years of school and how I really wanted to be that kind of teacher for students that you know made a difference in their lives. So I attended the, the Noyce meeting and I applied for it and I, that kind of started me on that path. And I was able to go into the classroom of a master teacher for two years um my final year of my degree and my first the credential program year and i was able to experience you know everything in, in the classroom and with the students and have that preparation uh going into my first year of teaching thank you thank you yeah like um i can share a little bit myself um i um my mom I uh, was an elementary teacher and she had um, a lot of um, influence on me to um, choosing um, chemistry education. In, I, um, I went to school, I went to my K-12 K to and the university and college in China. So I went to a chemistry education uh, and uh, thinking that um, I will teach, but um, uh, a lot of my um, friends, um, uh, you know, they, they they wanted to go to you know PhD masters programs in chemistry or other sciencey technology related fields and I did the same thing and then I was in a PhD in chemistry program for a year and then I found out I I was still very interested in teaching rather than um, working in a lab uh, you know uh, not talking to a person whole day <laughs> so um, I really love teaching and. And I also, uh, I taught three years high school chemistry and, um, and I, I found out a lot of things needs improvement in the classroom. And um, that's, that's what motivated me to really pursue a PhD in science education. And now I'm, I'm teaching um, science masters and masters and I'm really happy uh, for what I'm doing now, yeah. Uh, so yeah, this uh, four uh, middle school, high school teachers just now, they, you know, they are not only um, STEM teachers, middle school, high school STEM teachers, but also they are they're great teachers and they have been staying in the field for a, quite a while. And, um, you know, the second question about the motivation, uh, motiv uh, what motivate you to stay in teaching? That is, that is also important because research says the turnout rate or the, re, um, you know, a lot of te young teachers, new teachers quit teaching in their first few years. So we want to also know um, how, if you choose to become a te STEM teacher or teacher in general, um, you know, what motivates a person to stay in teaching? Or if you have questions, uh, any questions up to now, or um, yeah. Afternoon. Okay, I got one question here, but we, we will answer that question a little bit later. Yes, Veronica. Uh, so motivation can somewhat be a challenge because you know the teaching profession takes a beating. The reward, though, take some time and it's the fruits of your labor. So you plan something, it could go completely wrong, but then at the end of the day or, you know, the end of the week, a kid will come up to you and say, um, this really resonated with me. They don't use that word, but you know, it, it's like something gets them. And even though those are not a daily occurrence as hopeful as we'd want it to be, um, those are the moments that really keep you going because there's hope for the future and um it just makes your job seem very rewarding 
And then you have to love your content. And I think transitioning from what I've done where I taught core math science to now I'm teaching coding and robotics and I'm teaching math through that. Um, but being able to integrate everything I learned from the master's program as well is making me love teaching all over again. And I just finished my 10th year. Um, I think similar to what Veronica was saying, um, it's knowing that you're making a positive impact in the lives of the students. Uh, the area that I teach has very low socioeconomics and a lot of our kids go through um, some really hard times. And I'm out of the classroom now, but when I was in the classroom, um, just knowing that even through the hard days when you know, your most difficult kids, you're, you're just making it difficult. And then a, a few days later, or even when they, they come back, um, I was an eighth grade teacher and I had ninth graders that would come back and share things with me that, you know, that, oh, I, I really miss your class. You know, when you said this to me, it really make it, made a difference. So just kind of knowing that in the moment, you don't really know the impact that you have on students. You might not think you're getting through to them, but um, eventually uh, that will have a positive impact on them. And through what I'm doing now with uh, teaching that master's course and also mentoring new teachers, um, just knowing that the impact I have through helping them is also directly positively impacting students has helped me to stay. Yeah, for me, I, I just, it's it's that aha moment when the kids finally get something and they want they ask all these other questions and they want to be more inquisitive about it they've captivated into the learning uh, but for me it's all about engagement uh, once the kids are engaged their eyes light up they want they're, they're motivated they want to do more um, and they are there early in the morning they're in there at lunch they're bugging you <laughs> but you you're you're realizing that they could be doing anything right now, but they're really fascinated with your classroom. They're fascinated with what you're teaching. Uh, I have kids after school that stay in there. Um, you know, since we've been on the distance learning, kids, I'm helping kids every day with tutoring for, you know, I'm teaching middle school, they're in high school already, but they still come back. Um, they're still wanting that, uh, that help, that guidance, but they want to stay engaged. And so, uh, what keeps me motivated is those little moments of uh, joy each day when that kid is like, oh, this is so cool, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, when they're coming into class, they already know what you're going to be doing because the last kids told them. Um, so it's, it's those kind of moments that really keep me going. I have a bunch of photos on my phone that, you know, when I, when I start wondering why I'm even doing this still, because you get those moments, you know, ten, uh, 11 years into teaching, I still get them where it's like, why am I even doing this? And you just pull up those photos, it's like, okay, this is why. It's those moments. Uh, I did see there was a questions about uh, new credentials and subjects. Um, when I transitioned from middle school from science to STEM and engineering, uh, there was no new credential for it. It's still kind of associated. When it's high school, I believe you have to get new uh, credentials for certain things, but middle school, it's a little different as far as uh, the credentialing, since it was still STEM, still science, it wasn't too much of a stretch. I have to just sign a little waiver every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah um, I, I would agree with everyone, everyone just said, with everything everyone just said. Um, I think for me, it's like those same reasons that I became a teacher is what keeps me motivated, is to continue, you know, um, helping these kids and, and helping them um, see what options are out there for them and so that to, to see you know I'm, I'm at high school so I do get to see them graduate and they come back and they tell me how they're doing and what college they're in and how they're struggling in their chemistry class and they need help so um, you know it's really rewarding to see to see that to see how I have paid it forward and they are making those those, those positive choices in their life so that's that keeps me motivated and same with with you know just even loving your content you know i also have tons of pictures of different labs that we do and i love the content i love chemistry and to see that enlightenment you know being passed on to the kids where they're like whoa that was so cool and you know they're just so excited by it and that again like just day to day that's that helps me stay motivated and, and in love with what i do 
Um, as far as uh, credentials, um, yeah, so I know that there are specialized credentials for high schools. So like I have a chemistry one. Um, if you decide to, you know, for instance, do physics or do math, then you would need that new credential. Um, I also taught middle school, um, and that's because I also have a general science credential. So those are two separate credentials that, that I was able to obtain. Mm -hmm. And that's how I jumped from middle school to high school. But in high school, it is a little bit different to jump from um, uh, from subject to subject. Yeah, for the credential, also, if you, um, if you jump uh, between the science subjects, uh, I believe you only need to take a new CSAT exam. Uh, right. But if you jump from science to say math or math to science, then you need to take the exam and also take one more master's course because they are separate master's courses. Uh, I, yeah, thank all of you um, about this, uh, your responses for this question. I think it's, it's really, you know, the difference is the impact you're making on, on people's lives that motivate, uh, motivate a lot of teachers to stay in this profession. And I also want to say he, here is um, teaching is not owning a job. It's, a really, it's really a profession you need to be passionate about, right? <laughs> then you will enjoy it. Um, and um, Arena, do you think, I think we, uh, we may need to answer some of the questions before it gets too long, so we lost, so we will lose the questions. So uh, the first question is here, is the credential program only available after receiving a bachelor's degree? Uh, yes, in California, in general, yes. Uh, it's a post-bachelorette uh, uh, program, as a credential program. Yeah. And Becky, um, if you want to add any, anything, you can just jump in, OK? Yeah, uh, we do have we do have the senior program mm -hmm. that if you're attending uh, Cal State San Bernardino already, that possibly it could work into your senior program up to three courses. Um, so with that, if you have room in your schedule when you're a senior, uh, just uh, email me and I'll get you that application. It's kind of a pre-credential. Okay. Yep. The the next one. Uh, the subjects we answer that and then the next one is um, um, the district nurse and have a house service credential would then have to start all over with a single subject credential um in i would say yes you need to um apply to the single subject credential program in order to have a teaching credential to teach in public schools and before that uh, you have to pass some exams, uh, and uh, we will cover those details after the teacher's panel, okay? Um, and the STEM program method, okay. So just a clarification, STEM by STEM here, we, okay, so today we're, we are mainly talking about math and science majors in the single subject teaching credential program, okay? And we call it STEM in like a general um, term. So may, basically we're talking about um, uh, you need to get a single subject teaching credential in one of these subject areas, math or science, um, to uh, be able to teach. Uh, the master's program, we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so, but you have to, but today we are only, uh, we're mainly talking about the credential program. And you have to go through a credential program to get a teaching credential. Um, computer science to teach computer science in high school. Uh, right, there's no single subject credential for the subject, and yes, um, so right now, um, there are, so you have to have a, basically you have to have a teaching credential to teach uh, in high school, right? And there is no um, computer science yet. Um, the easiest way or the simple, or the clearest way, pathway is to, Get a math math teaching credential. I would say you just need to take a few math exams, um, and then um, and get go through the teaching credential. Get a math 
uh, teaching credential, uh, and then you are automatically authorized to teach computer science. Is that 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 is something that's you know people are discussing about why? But now the um, the California teaching uh, the teacher credentialing you know agency they say. Uh, mathematics teachers are automatically authorized to teach computer science. There are some other, other uh, pathways though, yeah. Teach science with a degree in public house. Yes, I would say yes, as long as you pass those exams. Um, I think there's a question also for distance learning. Has distance learning changed? How yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's a question more for the teachers, yeah. not the programs. Yeah, how, how, yeah, that's a great question. How has distance learning changed how you keep them engaged? Yeah. I, I can jump on that real quick too. Um, for, di I mean, distance learning is a huge curveball because we didn't know we were going to go into that. And so it was like, okay, all our stuff's still at school. We're not allowed in, so go. Um, so we, you know, we, it, it, it was a huge adjustment. Um, you know, like Christina was saying, the kids we teach uh, don't exactly have a whole lot in the way of technology and stuff like that. So we had to get the Chromebooks out, hope for reliable internet at the homes, and then provide hotspots when they didn't have that. Um, so that was a little bit of a change, but then it's just the motivation and get, keeping the kids engaged throughout is, is tough. And so you have to do smaller chunks of information uh, to keep, cause, you know, you're fighting kids' engagement from their video games, TV, mom and dad yelling at them, whatever, and you have to help keep them engaged as well into the material. And it it, it is a tough learning curve for that. Um, you know, it, it it has been it's been a, a learning experience, and we'll see in the fall if we have to continue it or not. Uh, but it definitely has added more. And I'm probably speaking for everybody. It's added more into our toolbox, our teaching toolbox of things that we can pull from in the future. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree about the toolbox. I found so many resources out there from virtual labs to just websites that do adaptive practice and things like that that I would have never, or maybe I wouldn't have come across uh, if I was in the classroom doing traditional labs and things like that. So there's a lot of cool resources out there that I was able to pull. Um, so I agree that yes, I've I've added to my toolbox, and I 100% agree that it's it's we're we're definitely fighting with those other distractors at home, and so that's you know unfortunately beyond our control almost, and so we we're just doing the best we can. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else? Um, also I guess about the lesson plans change. Yeah, I guess that's kind of the. Uh, part of the third question here. How have your ideas about teaching might change from when you were in the credential program, like start teaching to now? And uh, that question is, how have your lesson plans changed or improved since you first began teaching? Um, it's Veronica talking. Uh, in the beginning, and even sometimes now when new curriculum rolls out, I kind of want it like, okay, give it to me the simple version, but yet prescribe. And then let me put my own twist on things, my own um, experiences and knowledge. And then sometimes I will take an idea and expand on it. And then other people are like, oh, we like that. We like that. That's going to be the new way. So it's um, gradually moved from me being um, a little bit self-conscious about what am I teaching? Do I really know what I'm teaching? To now I'm like, oh, I got this. I know what this is. And if I don't know, then I'm really willing to collaborate with other teachers, even language arts teachers and say, oh man, I forgot how to spell this word. Uh, I forgot how to grammatically say this in my lesson. Um, so it's having that confidence to be able to work with others, but also having confidence in yourself that has changed. Uh, for me, you know, I started the pro I started teaching uh, science and it was kind of what you get in the um, credential program, at least when I was doing it, where it's the way I was taught. And so you go in there, it's like, okay, pre-test, here's some lessons, take a quiz, some more lessons, take a test, okay, let's move on. Everybody got it, you know, and that, that's not how it works. Um, <laughs> and so all my lessons now are all project-based. Um, 
I do a lot of inquiry based. I can't remember the last time I gave a PowerPoint. Um, it's very much, let's do these activities, these hands-on activities, and now let's have these discussions. And you start treating the kids like these scholars that they are, and they, they rise to that occasion. And you get a lot more from that. So it's not just, here's all these facts. You know, all the new standards from since we were in school, they've all changed for science. Um, and so now it's not just facts, it's more application and inquiry. And you want those kids just thinking deeper. And so what I, I usually remind uh, kids when they get frustrated, like, why are we learning this? Why do I need to know this? I don't want to be an engineer. That's fine. That's great. I'm showing you how to learn. I'm giving you a way to learn how to learn rather than here, I need you to know all these random things. And so I want them to be uh, inquisitive. I want them to be asking questions and then start seeking out that information and the answers on their own to help become more independent rather than just me being up in the front, let me give you this lecture. I don't do that anymore. And that's, I mean, personally, that's at least how I've changed. Um, I do focus more on reading and literacy, even though I'm teaching STEM. Uh, we read two novels in my class as an elective uh, and the kids love it. And so you just have to relate the content back in and the kids start finding more value in that. And so I know you'll take a bunch of classes on literacy and you might be like, well, I don't really have to do that. That's not my job. It is. You can't teach the content without the vocabulary. You can't teach the content without uh, the writing and reading skills that you are helping build up. Um, for me, I had a similar experience in the credential program. Um, I was a biology major, so I went into the credential program as a bio major. And there is a lot of emphasis um, placed on you know, the subject matter. And again, we were operating under the 97 standards. So it was pretty much, you know, teach to the test, memorize the answers, all of that kind of thing. And once I started teaching, um, the emphasis was still kind of placed on that with um, administration. Um, just how are we reviewing and, you know, do the kids know the answer? And it was a little bit more difficult for me to start with the project-based learning um, because we were really focused on um, developing tests together as you know a group of teachers and you know common assessments and focused on that. And as the NGSS standards came out, and my administrator was super supportive of us as a science department jumping in early uh, to starting with those new standards, even though we still had to um, assess the kids on the 97 standards for the CST. She gave us her blessing just to, you know what, this is the future, go forward and, you know, just dive right in. And I would say that's the best thing that's ever happened um, because I was able to do more project-based learning and labs and um, like Chris mentioned, incorporate more reading and work with, you know, language arts teachers and math teachers and just really, um, do things that are encompassing of all subject areas and not just science. Um, and the other thing that's changed for me, uh, when I was in the credential program, again, the emphasis was placed on the content. And what's changed for me is how important relationships are uh, with students, developing that relationship. And I, I love science. I'm really passionate about that subject area. But just kind of going in and seeing like, oh, like the kids don't care about science the way I do. So just trying to find those ways to make them care, come up with um, really fun activities for them to get interested and also investing, I would say, like 70 to 80% of it is that relationship that you have with the student. You need to invest in that upfront um, in order to gain access to their brains to, to teach them the content you're gonna teach. You think you're going in there to be a math teacher, to be a science teacher? You're, no, you're not. <laughs> you're going in there to just be a teacher and build a relationship with that student. And then on the side, you're teaching that content. Yeah, I, I had a, a, a little different experience because I started teaching right in the middle of the NGSS adoption. So um, I was given the textbooks, but I was told don't follow these textbooks because they're not what we're supposed to teach. 
And fortunately, I had a very uh, strong team at Pacific of other chemistry teachers who were all, you know, they're all for NGSS and they're willing to try anything. And so that's kind of the environment that I came into. And I just had to step out of my comfort zone. That's not how I was taught, but, you know, that's what everyone's doing. And, and we were able to collaborate and figure out, we were just kind of going like, you know, trial basis and see how things went uh, with, with projects and, um, you know, doing uh, real world, you know, PBL projects and things like that. So, so it, it was an interesting time. It was difficult. I had no resources, so I had to be very creative and I had to kind of scramble and find things. Um, but I'm very fortunate to have gone through that because I've been able to kind of refine my craft since then. And um, I would say uh, as, a, as, a, as a team, as a district, as a whole, I think we've definitely been ahead in NGSS. I've gone to conferences in other states and, you know, a lot of teachers are, are just barely talking about the idea of it. So I was, again, like, even though we had no resources, no textbooks, we just adopted a textbook this year. And so even though there were no, no NGSS resources for us, I think just being ahead of the game is, um, was, was really enriching for me um, as a learner, trying to figure out what, how to teach. Um, so, so yeah, my, my experience was a little bit different, but I think at, at the beginning, um, it's just something, um, even the teachers I work with now that I coach, I, I remind them, you know, you don't know unless you try, you know, and so that was kind of my attitude. I would try things and, you know, try projects, try um, different labs and almost set my classroom on fire a couple of times, but, you know, we made it through. And um, like I said, it just helped me refine my craft and, and, and understand, okay, we're not going to leave the buns and burners out in front of the students next time, you know? And so it's just, again, every year it gets, it gets, uh, you, you learn every year. So yeah, it's definitely mm -hmm. different times. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's also, you know, you keep improving from year to year, you know, you teach differently every year. And that's also something um, really uh, keep people, keep us, you know, teachers in, stay in the profession. Uh, you always have something new to, to try out. Yeah, and I, I will, you know, again, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I'm sure I'm not wrong. Um, don't think that everything's going to be perfect every day. You know, even veteran teachers, if they're 20, 30 years teaching and they say, oh, no, my class is perfect. No, it's not. It's not. And it's, it, you're working with kids. And so you can't control kids. You don't want to control kids. You want to use the, the assets they have and really build them up and give them uh, proper engagement and everything. And so you know, I'm going in there thinking, okay, my kids have to be in their seats, quiet, not a single sound, and they're all writing notes and listening to me. Kids don't learn like that, <laughs> you know, and it, that might have been me when I was younger. You know, that's how I learned. It's like, okay, I got this. I got this. Let me write these notes and all this. That's not how kids learn, especially with all the technology and uh, distractions that are out there right now. Everything is short, little uh, bits of information that they're retaining and you have to make it relevant um, you know and that that's you know like uh, Anna said going to those conferences and really just bringing in more information and more uh, ideas and what's out there you know get that social media going and see and follow all these teachers and see what they're doing nationwide I mean I've been pulling ideas since we've been on distance learning uh, I've had you know, we all have a lot of extra time now. And so it's just, okay, I'll sign me up for that conference. I don't have to travel now. I don't need a sub. I don't need any of that. Let's look at what they're doing. I can do this, this, and this. And, you know, you just get really excited and re-energized after those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also a bonus of teaching, I think it's you, like, uh, like Chris just mentioned, you need to keep learning um, what the kids are doing. So you stay young forever. <laughs> I'm in middle school 10 years, okay? I'm, I'm not afraid to say that I'm stuck in middle school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so we're, um, uh, we're a few minutes, uh, we have a few minutes left and, uh, according to our schedule. Um, so our, uh, 
fourth question is, um, what are some suggestions do you have for people who are interested in STEM? Um, if, you know, if you have some great ideas, mm, feel free to share. If not, mm, uh, we will turn to some of the questions here. Um, I would say come visit, you know, come visit a classroom. Uh, Anna and I are demo teachers. And so that's what part of our job is, is to open up our classrooms once, once we're allowed back in our classrooms ourselves. Uh, come visit and see what we're doing. Um, you know, just email us and set up an appointment and come visit. You know, you can sit in there for a day, a period, whatever, and just really see what it's like and see the, the reality of teaching and if it's something you're interested in doing, I will say though, you know, Christina and I, that's, you, you have some really good uh, conversations about teaching, but you really got to value it. And when you do, it's really rewarding. It really is. I have kids that, you know, have graduated, they're in college. I still contact them all the time. They contact me and bug me. Um, I play video games with some of them now, you know, like, it's just, it's a lot of, it's a lot of, um, reward uh, for the investment you make. Um, I think if you're interested in STEM, don't let those four letters scare you off and think that you're teaching the four areas, science, technology, engineering. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> um, because I think that puts people off. And when we were in the program, Anna, you can attest to this, we had some teachers that were single subject. We had some that were in elementary. We had some that had come from completely non-teaching backgrounds that were in the program. And when you are able to pull in ideas from different places, that is the very goal of what you wanna see happen in your classroom. You have all kinds of kids that are coming from different backgrounds, strengths, interests. Some of them hate math, some of them hate science. And you have to be able to teach those kids whether they love it or hate it. So it's great to learn in the STEM program how to integrate and really pull in, okay, I know you don't like science, but we're not teaching science. So you're going to learn about science through some other integrated activity here. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica, for sharing. That's great. Um, I, I'd like to add, um, you know, kind of, uh, reiterating what Christina had mentioned earlier about relationships. They're so important. Um, and same as, as Chris had mentioned, I had a teacher in high school who, you know, we had to stand up straight and we couldn't wrinkle a paper. And so I thought, oh, his classroom management is amazing. I'm going to do the same thing. But it didn't work for me. I'm, I'm much smaller. I have a much more, you know, uh, lower voice and it just didn't work for me. And and that's what I wanted. I wanted my kids to, you know, line up and all this, and you know, it's high school. And so um, uh, I think just definitely being patient with yourself, understanding what works for you, and um, building those relationships with the students, it really makes a big difference. I think it's, it, I, you know, reflecting on that question about what has changed from my, when I first started teaching to now, and, and that has a, a huge part of it, um, because I've, I've learned and in even working with different teachers, different teaching styles, it's, it's really what is tolerable for you, you know, as far as classroom management goes. It's, you know, what are you okay with? Some teachers are okay with their students just casually getting up and sharpening a pencil. Some teachers, you know, maybe that doesn't work for them, you know. And so it's just be patient with yourself, learn about yourself and what's tolerable to you. And, and just take it day by day, every, every day, every year, you know, you learn something new. I think what's helped me survive is just that attitude of when something goes wrong, just, okay, what can I do to make it better? What can I do to fix it? Um, and it's an ongoing challenge. And, and, you know, just like we mentioned earlier, veteran teachers, it's an ongoing, you know, always trying to, trying to, trying to better your craft. And so I think that's, I think if you're going into teaching, you know, you just kind of have to remind yourself to, to be patient, be flexible and be patient with the students and, and really get to know your students so that you know you you build that that foundational relationship to help you succeed throughout the school year and just really quick to take that relationship concept one step further um again like chris anna and anna mentioned get in as many classrooms as you can to visit to, to see things happening it's one thing to to talk about it with somebody but it's a totally different thing to be in the classroom and 
seeing the kids, you know, interact and, you know, do um, the projects and interact with each other. And the second thing is develop as many connections and relationships with other teachers as you possibly can, because that's where you're going to build um, your community and your resources when you have you know, a bad day or you're struggling. Those are the people that you're going to go to, to to make it through and to get ideas from and just to talk about things with. So make those professional connections with the people you work with as well. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. Chris, Christina and Chris mentioned going into other teachers' classrooms and I think Dr. Yin emailed me and asked me uh, about pre-teachers coming in, in to, to observe me teaching in my classroom. I didn't even know what it was for. It's from Dr. Yin, and I just said yes. That's usually the way it works. Uh, so if any of you connect with Dr. Yin and you're interested, I'm just throwing it out there, not saying I work any magic or do anything special, but I don't mind having visitors in my classroom. And I don't mind if you ever wanted to challenge yourself and be like, well, can I just do a little demonstration? Go for it. Like that's the way, other way you're gonna learn is trying to do it yourself and getting feedback and the feedback doesn't even have to come from me. The kids will give you plenty of feedback, believe me. Yeah, thank you, Veronica. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Anna also emailed me about, and you know, do you have any student or anything that, you know, um, she can host people in her classroom too. So they're great people. They're very nice people. And um, if you have any interest in, in um, uh, seeing a classroom, just let me know. My emails, uh, I, I believe it's in the, the PowerPoint that you're going to get and, and the program brochure also. Um, and yeah, just email me and I will help you connect with them. Um, so we have uh, two Matt, questions here. Um, one is about um, balanced teaching and the research, possibly a PhD program. Um, I think, you know, um, I, I mean, PhD or master's, uh, you know, uh, 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 an advanced degree. Um, so if you're thinking about an advanced degree, you definitely can do kind of part-time uh, degree uh, or pro program while you're teaching. I know a lot of people did that. Myself, when I did my PhD in the States, um, I was a full-time stu PhD student. I, but, well, that's not correct, actually. I, 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 helped, I helped teach undergrad science classes, actually. That's, that's how I paid my tuition. Um, so yeah, you always do that. Uh, some people, uh, they teach middle school, high school while doing a PhD or master's. And, uh, I, I, I guess if not all, most, most people, they do teaching um, while uh, uh, advanced degree program, yeah. And uh, a question? freshman, yeah, go ahead. I think Matt had a question regarding. Um, oh, the difference between high school and middle school, right? Experience, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So before I let the teacher panel go, um, yeah, I, I will just, we'll focus more on, you know, the questions that really they can answer, uh, okay? not not particularly, you know, about how to apply to the program. <laughs> okay. That so, bit, yeah. We'll yeah. So how, how have you liked teaching the different age group, middle school versus high school? Yeah, um, I can answer that. So I started teaching high school, then I went and I taught uh, two years of middle school and then went back to high school. And so um, I think uh, the, the reason I switched to middle school was to challenge myself because I always heard there was a, the challenging age group, and and I'm thankful I did because I it, I did challenge myself and um, I learned so much. I think there, uh, from my experience, there's so much more high energy, and I had to definitely, you know, that that patience I was talking about, and and just kind of working with your crowd, and and you know, there were just so much more high energy, and so I really had to adapt to that. I think my classroom management skills really grew. Um, and I think just being engaging in, in, in multiple ways, you know, I was able to grow in that area as well. And now uh, I'm back to high school and I'm able to apply some of those things I learned in middle school um, to, to continue to engage my students. There, 
they're still kids. They're, they're just in bigger bodies, but they're, they're still kids. Um, I think in high school, they, they tend to pretend to be more disengaged, like they really don't care. But you can get in there and you can, you know, by showing them some cool demo or, um, you know, making class a little bit engaging, a little excited, um, that, that same kid comes out where, you know, they're, they're high energy. So I, I love both. I can't say anything, you know, bad or I prefer one over the other. I think they're both really great experiences. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, mm -hmm. who's her question that was, but uh, yeah. I can definitely say I prefer middle school <laughs> uh, <laughs> over high school, uh, but I, you know, the ones that know me, they know I'm kind of like a big kid already. And so I kind of fit in with the middle school crowd and uh, in how I act and stuff. Middle school is definitely a place where you can't expect to be showing up and, you know, have that proper teaching experience. You're going to have fun. You have to be engaging, but you want to get more involved. Kids want you at, they care that you show up to their basketball game or their softball game. They care that you're there. They're, they want to show you anything that they've done. Um, you know, here's this picture I drew. You have middle school boys coming up. Look, look at this picture I drew. I'm like, okay, cool. That's awesome. And, you know, you don't want, you, you, you can't be dismissive of that. And so you have to be relatable and everything. Um, and, you know, I have a few students that are in Anna's class now and they, they definitely get to continue that. And they have fun with that because you've had that experience um, where they feel more engaged rather than just disconnected from the class experience completely. Um, and in, in middle school, you really got to captivate them with that and really get them to want to pay attention because again, they're moving from elementary where, you know, it's, they have to do this, it's fun into high school where I'm too cool to do this. Or like you said, pre pretend to be too cool to do this. <laughs> you know, middle school is that middle ground where they're trying to figure it still out. Uh, just really quick for me, I've only taught middle school, but when I first, before I started teaching, I always had this idea that I don't want to teach middle school. I, I just want to teach high school. But when you go and apply for a job and they tell you, oh, okay, you have a you know single, single subject credential and oh, we have this middle school position and you just kind of, okay, that's, I guess I'm middle school now. But having done middle school and now um, having the opportunity to mentor teachers that are high school teachers and being in high school classrooms, um, I, I could see myself going from middle school to high school and having an easier time teaching high school rather than if I would have started in high school and going down to, to middle school because like Anna said, um, even the high school students, they pretend to be too cool, and, but they really uh, do appreciate having fun and you still need to have you know, those structures in place for them where you really need to have those structures in place for the students in middle school. And for middle school, like the, the kids aren't afraid to have fun and you just make develop those relationships and make those connections with them. So um, I think I'm a, a middle school land person. Thank you. Um, another question here, how much does having or not having a master's degree affect you and your teaching? Do the teachers who don't have a master's degree regret not having one? I know all of you have master's degree. <laughs> um, from my circle of colleagues and friends uh, that are teachers, some of them are like, eh, I'm fine with a bachelor's degree. And then some are like, yeah, I should have gotten it. I'd be making more money, you know. Um, but personally, me, it was always a goal to get a master's degree. Just life happened and I took a break about seven years from the credential to starting the master's program. And um, it always weighed on me because I feel personally that it's more esteemed to have a master's degree that parents and community members look at you differently because you have that MA title next to your name. But that's my you know, perception of how the world views me. That's not everybody else, um, but it is nice to brag. <laughs> I think I found in my experience that whenever I, I, you know, asked, you know, a similar question, like, should I get a master's degree? I asked colleagues or mentors. And um, a lot of the advice I got was, 
you want to get an administrative master's degree because in case you know something opens up um, and you decide to become an administrator later on you know that's kind of like the advice i would always get um but for me it, that wasn't the motivation it wasn't the money it wasn't the the maybe perhaps there'll be a, an opportunity later on for when i heard of the, of the stem master's degree that that was the motivator for me because i wanted to again perfect my craft and, and get better at what I was doing and I think it gave me a lot of more insight um, and gave me more tools to be more intentional in my teaching and so for for me it's it's been a great professional development experience because everything I was I was learning I was able to apply immediately um, into my class and, and I've grown since then so so for me it was it was definitely for me to, to become a better teacher um, and I really appreciated it I, I'm, I'm glad uh, I remember speaking um, to a lot of those people who, who you asked me later, wait, why didn't you do your administrative? And I said, you know what, I don't regret it. I'm really happy with the STEM masters that I got. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> That's a good test, testimonial for the <laughs> STEM master's degree. <laughs> Anyone, um, Chris and Christina, do you, want, do you have anything to share? Uh, just real quick, um, I'm one of those people that did get the administrative master's degree, um, but I always thought I wanted to get a master's degree in, you know, in science or education. Um, but in, it took me, you know, a long time to get to that point because once you start teaching, you always kind of think, okay, maybe next year, maybe next year, because you're just you just get so busy and if you know you're involved in all the extra school activities, doing everything, you just have no time. Um, but I just I had an opportunity to um, get a scholarship uh, for the administrative uh, master's degree. And I, I will say um, I have no intention of being an admin right now. I, I love what I do. I feel like I'm a lot closer to the students and I'm really helping teachers. Um, but it did give you it gave me more of a perspective from the administrators to be able to to see like their world and what they go through and see how schools and education in general operates from a bigger picture. And that has allowed me to help my teachers and through that help the students. So um, I think it was a good degree. Yeah. yeah and I got the uh, admin degree because Christina made me do it. Um, I wasn't gonna apply and she said, no, you're gonna do this with me. And we both got a scholarship for it and decided to go through it. It, it was a lot, you know, a lot of time investment and stuff and, you know, trying to balance your schedule. I felt busy all the time, but it did enhance my teaching. It did make uh, everything better uh, for me because I got to see everything through the lens, like Christina said, as an admin, but I got to advocate for my class more, knowing exactly where the funding's coming from and what we can target to help build things up uh, within my class. And then I felt like I was that go-to person for my admin now and like oh hey can you do this and stuff so you get to see the other lens you get to work with the kids in another way when you're doing that uh you're doing your admin credential work um i'm i've been thinking and considering getting a, a master's degree in stem education as well because why not it was a fun experience the first time might as well go through and do it uh, for stem education to enhance what i'm doing because I'm, I, I love going to conferences just to take in new material. Um, I just hate missing class. I hate being out of my classroom. So um, pursuing like a master's degree in it would definitely be beneficial for uh, what I want to be, what I want to continue teaching. Thank you, thank you. Um, any other questions? Don't, don't be afraid to speak, uh, everyone. Uh, yeah, if you want to um, ask a question, you just go ahead and you don't have to type. Anyone, any questions? If not, um, let's try this. Give them a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Yin, someone mentioned something about environmental education. In oh the yeah. Um, so the STEM program is not specific to any science. You actually cover all of the sciences and our um, instructors in the masters, the, the STEM masters program, 
were really great at honing in on you as the teacher, what did you want to take in, out of a specific course or what did you want to take from a specific lesson? So if environmental education is kind of sitting there with you, believe me, those um, you know issues come up throughout the coursework and sometimes they just came up naturally without anybody asking. It was like, uh, when we were in the program, the the Orville Dam issue up in Northern California just happened to be the issue in the news, and it just happened to cross over into one of our classes one night. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty neat that it was um, a current event. Yeah, I think a lot of biology teachers also teach environmental science. Yeah, if you have a biology uh, credential, uh, you can teach both. Yeah, thank you, Veronica. Thank you. Okay, so if not any, any uh, new questions, I will let the four teachers go, uh, and then we will do the rest of the information. Thank you again, Veronica, Anna, Chris, Christina. Thank you so much. I, I actually haven't seen Veronica and Anna for a while, um, and it's so good to see you. Uh, yeah. Okay, Great. thank you. You too, it was a pleasure. Yeah, yeah thank hope you. to see you. Thank you. I have yeah. my, my, my hat here. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> from, uh, it, it's alumni night from Dodger Stadium. Sadly, we won't be able to do that. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Have a good Bye. night. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, we... I, we actually have um, Dr. Maynard and Dr. Pantula from the College of Natural Sciences here. Yeah. Hi, welcome. Sorry I joined you late. Um, yeah, I'm Dave Maynard. I'm a um, professor in chemistry and biochemistry. And I've been listening. Um, I was actually, well, I, I I taught middle school science and math. I realized I started that in 1978 <laughs> and taught for three years. Um, you have to love teaching. Um, I, I think it is an incredibly important career, um, especially if you're so inclined. And again, I have a love of teaching. Um, it's important to me and it's really important to our society as well. Um, I'll just make a couple of notes. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to take over here or waste or spend too much time. But um, one thing is that I want to talk about. Uh, make you aware of the uh, opportunities to teach um, as an undergraduate. Um, those opportunities you can find at the CME website, which is the uh, Center for Excellence in Math Education. There's two programs. One is the early teaching experience in mathematics and science, um, and that actually gets you into a classroom. And we also uh, have noise scholars, um, and that gives you some more practice. Way back 40 years ago, it was when I went out looking for a job for science and math, I got about five offers. And I think if I went out today, I'd probably get 10. Okay, so there is a terrific job market out there. Um, there's also just their teaching and what you learn are good basic skills, um, whether in teaching or not, because at some point you are going to have to uh, teach someone. About subject, right, with the way teach now, they do have common core. So you do teach science, all the subjects, biology, geology, a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of physics, and a little bit of math. Um, and so having that broad background um, first is what's enjoyable about teaching um, and, and important. So with that, um, hi, welcome, and um, please continue with your program. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about the noise program and um, early science mass teaching uh, experience program. The um, the deadlines are approaching uh, quite soon. Um, can I share uh, share my screen, Alina? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. 
here. Let me see. Mm. It doesn't let me to, but um, yeah, or we can, um, we can uh, send you the flyer here, uh, flyer. Uh, why is the noise program? Noise program is for students that, um, that really, the, that are really interested in teaching. Uh, uh, usually you go, uh, you start with junior, or you can start with junior or senior, senior or the teaching credential program, and you get up to $10,000 scholarship of one year, but you have to promise to teach in the San Bernardino um, Unified School District for every, uh, for two years, for every one year of scholarship. And there are some, um, uh, some really good opportuni uh, opportunities and also obligations for you to engage with the program uh, throughout uh, when you are in the program. So you have to invest in a certain amount of time in the program. Um, okay, so that's a noise program. And, um, and then there is early science teaching, early science mass teaching experience program that Dr. Maynard mentioned. It's for students who kind of want to get a taste of teaching. Um, you can get up to $1,000 a semester, I, I, I believe. Um, so it's a, it's a it's it's a lot lighter compared to the noise program. Uh, you kind of plan a lesson, teach a lesson. You work with a group and a faculty member, plan a lesson, teach a lesson, and reteach it. Or observe some other uh, observe um, classroom teachers and, and observe other people teaching it. So it's kind of a, a just a, a introductory experience to the teaching profession for you. Okay, and that's you know if you are junior or sophomore, that would be a wonderful opportunity for you, okay? Um, yeah, uh, I, I will ask Arlena to also send out some, uh, the flyer to you after this, okay? Yeah. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start then. Um, okay, so I guess we'll go ahead from this point on, uh, we'll start going into the actual um, credential program, so any questions, I'll try to go, as quickly as possible. I know we have about 30 yeah. minutes or so. Um, so why the College of Education here at Casa San Bernardino? We are a state accredited institution. Uh, we do also include the English Learner Authorization or the EL Authorization. So if you ever had uh, a job posting through the through EdJoin or through school district and you have EL authorization that's they're asking for that, know that that's already embedded in the program. So they're not expected to take any additional tests or or courses as that's already part of the curriculum. We do serve both Riverside and San Bernardino counties. And so in terms of that, I mean, for your student teaching or internship, you can do it in any one of those two counties, at least while you're in the program. And then once you finish the program, then you're free to go anywhere in California or even transfer or go, you know, relocate. It's a lot easier for you to relocate with the California credential than to bring an out-of-state credential into California. We'll talk a little bit about program options. All of our classes are typically in our, in our College of Education building, but of course right now everything is done uh, virtually or online. Um, we'll talk a little bit about tuition towards the end. And many of our school districts will typically come out, I'd say about March, uh, to meet our candidates. So it's always a good opportunity for you to come out, meet with our uh, school districts or county offices of ed. Um, that can be any public, private, or charter schools. So single subject credentials specific to a content area. And Dr. Um, Yin, if you want to interject, please feel free to, to do so. So this is single subject, a specific subject. You will identify that subject. And of course, for your math or science, um, you can always add another content area like Dr. Yin mentioned earlier. You would just you know, have to take the CSET in that content area and you may or may not have to take or add the methods course uh, through Cal State. Um, and that can be done by Cal State, through Cal State or through any other university that offers an accredited credential program. So usually you're, you're teaching about seventh to 12th grade, that's middle school, high school, um, and everyone in California is required to hold a credential. So you can hold a doctorate, a master's degree, but you will need a teaching credential if you're interested in teaching in public schools uh, in California. So here's our program, program options. We're looking at student teaching versus internship. Um, in the next slide, I'll, I'll show you what that difference is. And then track options, full-time, part-time. And then classes are usually late afternoon and evenings. I think we're anticipating that this coming fall of 2020, if that's the, the semester you're hoping to start, seems like things are gonna be online. Um, I, Dr. Yen, can you confirm that? Is that? 
so far I think that was Sorry, I was muted yeah the fall is online yeah um, so yeah. that would be probably meeting. Typically, classes would start maybe at 4 or at 7 p.m. now as we transition into the semester. So Correct. here are your two um, pathways, right, to earn a credential. So as a student teacher, you're placed by the College of Education, or I should say we're working along with the school districts to place you at the school site. You will indicate what top three districts you prefer to be placed at. And our supervision office of the College of Education will make the request to the district and the district decides, yeah, we're placing this candidate at this site with this teacher. Uh, we'll see how that works out too, right? Hopefully by student teaching time, which usually happens in the last semester of the program, Hopefully things will come back to at least some normal. Uh, if not, we'll see what your options will be. But typically, uh, student teaching is for one semester. And so that you are repeating, you are reporting, I should say, to the school site every day, all day. Um, so this is where it's hard to hold that daytime job. Um, our hope is, however, that you are doing well as a student teacher, you have to almost look at it as a long-term interview. It's, if a position becomes available, you want them to consider you as a candidate, of course. So uh, the intern option, on the other hand, is a paid position versus a student teacher is not. Uh, but it's up to you to secure the contract as an intern. You are the teacher of record, so you are a full-time teacher during the day, and then you're coursework in the evening for, towards a credential. So the coursework is structured so that you meet the demands as a new teacher. Um, so this will give you up to two years to complete the coursework. Typically, however, most of our students will finish it now in the semester, maybe three semesters is what it's gonna take, because you have to intern for two semesters versus one semester of student teaching. There are pre-service courses that you must complete before you can become an intern. Okay, so we'll cover what those courses in the, uh, will be. Now, keep in mind, most students will start as student teachers and they won't transition into the internship track until you come in with a contract and you've already shown that uh, pre-service courses are complete. Okay, so we'll explain that. So intern candidates, there's a few things that the College of Education will verify that you have before they can issue a letter of intern eligibility. We have to verify that you've met U.S. Constitution. As a CSU grad, you would have met U.S. Constitution. And then these are your pre-service courses that are the first uh, three courses that you typically take in the credential program. So they're not extra courses. They're just the first you know, few courses that you're gonna take and you have to have those before you can become an intern. Secure employment and then you're officially an intern. This allows you to get paid. Uh, get benefits and of course this is counting towards retirement so it's a good deal if you can uh, secure that and of course the need is out there so the possibilities um, there's definitely some possibility there so track options so we look at track a b c and d so a and b are your student teaching tracks so it's 27 semester units track a is your through two semesters so you can get it done in one academic year or three semesters um, and that would mean just depends on when you start. You can start the track A or B in the fall or the spring. You have the seniors for teaching, um, and this allows our seniors, if you're currently you know, a senior at Cal State San Bernardino and you're interested in taking those pre-service courses, you can take them as a senior. So Dr. Sombrero is working on that and see how that will work. And then the internship course, if you transition into the internship, this would typically be a three semester program. So again, you would intern the last two semesters. So we look at your course sequence here. You see your first semester, you're taking all your courses, 14 units in that first semester. And these are your four uh, pre-service, there are three pre-service courses, the one with the asterisks on them. Those are the first three classes that we need to see grades posted before we can issue that letter of eligibility. 120 hours are also required, 120 hours of observation, and those are tied typically to those courses. So what we expect is that you do a few hours during the week, and that could be two to three days a week. Uh, those hours are usually set up with the resident teacher. However, in the fall, that might be a little different. I believe if Dr. Ganyu can confirm this, that they're allowing them to possibly look at videos, uh, clips or something with teachers. In yeah, there are some alternative ways and yeah, during the online teaching period, um, yeah. They'll figure it out. So what we're working with is the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing, trying to see you know, what options we can give our students as we're dealing with the COVID-19 situation. Um, in the second semester, you start your, your field work, which is your student teaching, and you're taking two courses, and then what they call the teacher performance assessments or the CalTPAs, um, and these are just uh, 
your, you have your faculty advisors or group sessions that you have uh, to help mentor and support you through that process. Dr. Yang, could you speak more on mm -hmm. the TPAs? Um, yeah, the, now, well, it, there are some, uh, there are some changes, uh, I mean, alternatives for TPAs. I, I know that some people are choose to not do TPA right now, um, you know, and they, they can do TPA uh, in their first year of teaching. And some people, they, they chose to do TPA now. And I, I think that's fewer people. And uh, if they, um, the difficult part he, now here is, is to work with their mentor teacher. Um, so if their mentor teacher are really supportive, um, they can still do TPA even, you know, during this uh, COVID-19 situation. I, but I think um, quite a few students choose to uh, postpone it. Yeah. And the TPAs are state mandated. So there's two TPAs that you're required to, to, mm -hmm. to pass. But um, well, hopefully, hopefully, you know, for you guys, you know, we're going to go back to face to face in the spring, next spring, and your student teaching won't start until spring, um, no matter what track you're doing. Okay, the first semester, you won't do any TPA the first semester. Okay, and then uh, you will start student teaching uh, student teaching uh, in the second semester um, the first semester you will you will do some uh, observations yeah uh, the 120 hour observation yeah okay so here's your three semesters same number of units again these this um, course sequence or track B is basically doing all your coursework up front in the first two semesters and then leaving your student teaching in the third semester with your TPA meetings um, so that's an option too. Just keep in mind that if you were to start in the fall, this would be fall, spring, you'd come back in the fall. So we're not offering the courses in the summer, if that makes sense. So you can start this in the fall or the spring. And then you have your track D, which is your internship option. This is just a sample of what it could look like. The, again, you would have to secure a contract um, the sooner the better, of course. And this is what it would look like if you were able to secure it by the second semester. And then the seniors for t teaching, that is something that you would, uh, we would have you meet with Dr. Sombrero to kind of give you a program plan, see exactly what that would look like. Um, so I'm gonna go into Cal State Apply real quick. So when you start Cal State Apply, everything's done online. That's if you're ready to start this coming fall um, or in the spring, you have four quadrants. And so this is what you typically will look at. Uh, you have academic history, support information and program material. This is where I'm gonna spend most of our time is under program material because that's the, credential program requirements. So Cal State Apply is a $70 application fee. They do ask that you upload unofficial transcripts to Cal State Apply. So for our CSUSB grads, then that means you will not, you won't need to provide official transcripts, right? This only applies to those who are not CSUSB uh, grads or will be. Um, so for unofficial, the, the system does require that section be filled. So you can use a Word document, state that you're a CSUSB grad or will be, and just upload the Word document to that section and you're good to go. Um, if you earn your degree outside the country, they may ask for TOEFL, but we will start communicating, we, College of Education and the Office of Graduate Study uh, with, uh, with you via email to, you know, anything that's missing on your application needs fixing, we'll start communicating with you. An advising form is required, so by attending this session, uh, we have record that you attended. We will send, I will send you an email, follow-up email with an advising form, just as confirmation that we've uh, met either one-on-one -on -one or via a Zoom through information sessions and things like this. So that will be attached to your email. Transcripts, again, for those CSUSB grads, uno trans unofficial and official are not required. So this is something you can cross out. You've met this because, of course, we have all of your coursework on file. Um, for those of you who are not CSUSB grads, if we have any who are not CSUSB students, um, if we have any, those uh, are required. So we ask that your official transcripts be sent to the College of Education. So we, there's two areas uh, that the state of California requires that you meet. We need basic skills and we need subject matter competency. So basic skills typically is met by your CBEST exam. That's the most popular way to meet this requirement. It's not the only way. So there are other options. You have the CSU placement test. So if you scored high uh, in your EAP or your, um, your English or math placement test, 
You can use those scores or SATs, ACTs, or AP scores in both math and English. You can use those scores, official scores, to meet your basic requirements. Okay, so I can send you the link to the CTC and they'll give you the options on where you can retrieve these official uh, scores, especially if you're referring to the SATs, ACTs, or APs. Now, if you took the uh, English and math placements at Cal State San Bernardino, we can verify that through your account. Now I should say, I know students are having difficulties right now because of COVID-19, their tests are being canceled. And so it's really important that uh, you know that this is temporary, there's a temporary relief due to the COVID-19 situation. We're allowing students to submit an application with this pending. It's not to say that it's completely waived, it's just allowing you some more time to get these tests so you can start this coming fall. And this is specific to fall of 2020. And that re it's also for a CSET, the subject matter competency exam. Um, so we're, we know that, you know, CTC is now, it seems like they're offering tests, uh, but they're not as many and some students are having to drive out pretty far. So if there's a delay with any of these two tests, feel free to still submit your application for the fall 2020. We ask that you still continue to schedule your test date as soon as possible, because it's still be required before you can start student teaching. And so you can start the program, but if you're doing a two semester program, then you need to get it done before you start the second semester. Preferably by November, but I think they'll wait until January uh, for these test scores. And so the CBEST never expires, the CSET expires after 10 years. So we ask that you have that. Now, if you're a math in the math teaching track, and of course you've waived this competency exam, you don't have to take the CSET. Your degree has granted you um, subject matter competency. And so you don't need to show any proof of that. Um, simply we use a Word document, state that you are at math, on the math teaching track, Cal San Bernardino, and then we'll go ahead and they'll evaluate your transcripts. Mm -hmm. And also for the CSAT, um, there are, for math and science, there, uh, there are uh, foundational math and foundational science and the specific subject matter math and a specific subject um, yeah. science. So they're different, um, you know, if you pass, uh, if, you, if, if you only pass a foundational level test, um, you, can, you can get credential. And then, uh, and later on you can uh, pass the specific subject matter test later and then add that authorization to teach a specific subject like biology, chemistry, physics. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I know some people, they, you know, they, they only passed um, foundational level science when they enter the credential program. Uh, bef but because you have to pass at least the foundational science or math to be able to enter the program before. Uh, we're not talking, you know, if it's not the COVID-19 um, situation. Right. Yeah, so for, for math, that's the nice thing with math and science. So math only, you can do subtest one and two and do foundational and be placed like in middle school or one, two, and three, right? Mm -hmm. Which your third is calculus and go through high school. For science, there's only two subtests. So you can do the found or general science, which is your subtest one and teach your middle school, typically your middle school science and, um, and then wait later. And that's at any time. You can be during the program or even after you've earned your credential, you can do it after. Do subtest two in the specialized science. So you always have that option. I would suggest aim for at least that one subtest for math, for science, and maybe the first two for math, if you need the math CSET, just to start the program um, and then continue to work on the other just you know, due to timing. All right, so just to continue on, on your application, we do ask that you have the certificate of clearance, which is your background check. Unless you're a substitute teacher and you've already been given clearance by the state, then they will, uh, that would be your clearance. Um, when, I know I have students who are also waiting for that. So if you're having difficulties for this fall of 2020 to get the clearance, um, you can also submit without that as, as that also applies to the negative TB. Um, if you're having difficulties getting that. Now these two requirements, you can submit without them. However, we will need to have them before you start class in August. So they are gonna put a hold on your courses until these two um, results, or I should say the clearance is given and the negative TB results are submitted, then we'll remove the, the hold. So you won't be able to register for your credential courses until those two are submitted. Um, two recommendations. 
are required. So we ask that you ask uh, professors, employers, or supervisors. This is completely done online through Cal State Apply. So you just have to provide the evaluator's name uh, and email, and then go ahead and submit the request. And you can submit the application with those pending. We just need to make sure that those recommenders are, are submitting their recommendations by the deadline date that you're trying to meet. So this is what it looks like. So you have recommendation tab, your name, their names, email, and the due date. You usually want to give them a due date, an earlier date that you're trying to meet so that they can um, submit that as soon as possible. I should also note that there's a questions mark tab there. If you're interested in the Palm Desert campus, you can actually answer the question Palm Desert on that one tab because unfortunately the university is not, hasn't provided the drop down for PDC at the graduate level. So we're gonna ask that you just answer that question so that we can include you on that list. GPA is a 2.67, that's your cumulative GPA or 2.75 in your last 90. Okay. Um, if, and then once you're in the program, of course, maintain the 3.0 GPA. And so here's like an overview of the admissions process. We're looking at the application on Cal State Apply, uh, submit official or unofficial transcripts if that applies to you. Uh, you have your program material, all that material is uploaded. Any documents that you cannot provide due to COVID-19, use a Word document, just state that, and that should allow you to submit. And as soon as our admissions technician goes through that, Amy Thomas, make sure that everything's good to go, then she will email you. Uh, we use Acuity to schedule an interview with our program faculty. Typically, it's maybe, I want to say Dr. Sombrero, maybe another a faculty or two and then they make the decision and then they invite you to attend orientation and this is where you'll pick the school district your program plan you pick which track a or b um, and then you register for classes as soon as your window opens so now we're looking at fall uh, 2020 deadline is july 13th so that's coming up so again any questions that you might have feel free to email and i can always you know address any questions via zoom or by phone and here's our spring of 21 july is our early deadline date and then the late is november 2nd we encourage you the earlier the better because we can start making the request to the districts as soon as possible for your placement Okay, and tuition, we're looking at about 4,000 a semester. So roughly, if you do a two semester, then you're roughly looking at about 8,000 to do a two, a two semester. And of course, if you have to add that third one, then that could potentially add another, you know, 2,500 or so. Mm -hmm. And financial aid, financial aid. You can receive financial aid as a credential student. There are federal and state grants available, so we encourage students to submit their financial aid application for whatever school year you're anticipating to start the credential. The TEACH grant is currently, we haven't heard any changes on the TEACH grant, um, but they're offering the TEACH grant to all of our, of course, math science, um, even our English majors, but 3.25 GPA is usually the requirement for the TEACH grant. If you don't meet it at the time that you apply the program, we can always do it throughout the year. So we'll look at after the first semester of the program and we can apply, you can apply for the TEACH grant there or then. What will happen is once you've uh, been admitted with no condition, then you can email me. We'll go through a certification form. It takes about five minutes and then be done. You just have to commit to teach in a low income school for four years and the first eight years of earning the credential. Um, and if you would not commit to those four years, it will turn into a loan with high interest. So something to think about if you have a district that you know is not considered a low income school. Mm -hmm. And did you want to talk a little bit more about any scholarships or anything like that, Dr. Yin? I know that yeah, um, so the scholarships, um, the Teach Grant, MISTI, the MISTI uh, gives students um, Get, uh, the math and science, not only science, math and science credential students, and, uh, I would say between a thousand and fifteen hundred um, dollars just for scholarship, and also reimburse your CSA taking fees and uh, and the professional if you join a professional association, uh, reimburse and, well, uh, the fees can be reimbursed too. Um, and then again, the noise program and the East End program. And um, yeah, there are a lot of good um, you know, opportunities and, and uh, for science math teachers because science math teachers are, are in great demand. And uh, are, uh, there are some, a few questions, Arena. Yeah. Um, one is, uh, is the advising form good for a while? Um, if we're, uh, we're not graduating this year, can we still use the advising form from today or 
where we need another one. You can use the same one. Things haven't really changed just with the COVID-19. That's the only difference right now. So it should be fine. Okay. Um, How can, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, the, another question is, how can we get EAP? Uh, I don't, I don't know what EAP is. <laughs> uh, it's the early assessment program. So oh, the okay. EAP, I'm going to send you all a link from the CTC and it's going to give you the option of how to uh, retrieve that. I think there's a college board. I'm not sure if it's a college board, but there's a link there that you can request those scores. Mm -hmm. um, An internship program. Can we teach any subject or only in the subject for our credential? I believe you, you need to teach the area, uh, your, your own area. Yeah. Uh, if you take a foundation, foundational science, you, you teach middle school science. You, if you, uh, you, you enter a program with a biology CSAT and you teach biology. Yeah. yeah. Will application be immediately re rejected if GPA does not be the minimum? It's a, it's a great question. I was going to talk about that. Uh, no. Um, if we, we, we also consider a GPA is a little bit lower than 2.6. 67 i think right yeah we um you know we not only assess students based on gpa we also you know assess the students overall uh and also from the interview um we we understand that and gpa doesn't necessarily reflect whether or not a person would be a good teacher um so yeah we usually we, we give you interview opportunities and even if your gpa is a little bit lower um, yeah, like 2.5, something like that. And we, we did admit students, yeah, with a little bit lower GPA in the past, yeah. Yeah, if you come in with a, a 2.5 or above, but not quite the minimum, they'll ask that you just write a letter. It's just attach it to your uh, application. If you're unable to upload it, you could just email it to uh, Amy Thomas, who's our admissions technician, so she'll include it as part of your application. So when you interview, they'll have an opportunity to, to address that. Yeah. Um, do people under the DREAM Act qualify for financial aid? Yeah, that, unfortunately, you, you're only eligible. I would go to, um, yeah, DREAMers, not for TEACH grant, unfortunately, um, and some financial aid, yes, or in some none. I think you have to look at specifically the aid that's available for our, our DREAMers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the next one, if you have a 3.0, is there any funding available like the TEACH grant? Um, so I'm... Not so the if, teach grant, I don't know. Um, well, I know NOISE program. Yeah. It will be a good, it will be a good program to consider. It pays, uh, the scholarship is up to $10,000 a year. Yeah, the NOISE one uh, will be a good one to consider. Okay. So the other questions we have just included here are faculty advisors, Dr. Yin, Dr. Sombrera. Um, you can feel free to reach out if there's any questions. I know we went through this pretty quick, but um, feel free to reach out if I need to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. We have our admissions technician, Amy Thomas. She, she will be emailing you once you submit your application if you need any help. And of course, you'll have my contact information as well. So feel free to email or call. And we are working remotely, but we're still meeting with students via Zoom and yeah. over the phone. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, remember that uh, we need um, we need a lot of math and science teachers. And um, you know, if you are interested, just um, email us and uh, ask any questions. If you have lower GPAs, if you have questions about um, financial aid and anything, you know, don't be afraid to ask. Um, the opportunity is here, okay. And um, Arlena, do you know a, uh, a little bit more about the TEACH grant, the TEACH grant GPA requirement for cumulative or major classes? It's a cumulative, yeah. It's all of your courses, anything you've taken, they're gonna look the cumulative. But as you said, you uh, students can apply like after one semester in the right. credential the, program. Right, and they only like, their, their GPA will, will yeah. you, you know, will be higher <laughs> by, that, right. by that time. Yeah, yeah, we, we understand, you know, the science departments, the science majors are, are difficult. <laughs> yeah, the GPAs tend to lower, to be lower, yeah. I have a teach grant question if, um, 
if our program is only, how, do you still have to commit to the full four years at a high need school? So what? I don't know if I understand this question correctly, but yeah. you still need to, you, I mean, there's the teach grant can award you up to 4,000. Um, yeah. You, you would have to commit for those 4,000. You'd have to commit those four years. Gotcha. Yeah. That was, that was the other question. Like if you went to a private school that cost 20 and you got 20 K in, in grant aid uh, versus 8 K for CSUSB. Yeah. It's like it's four years either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That they, the yeah, federal government wants to make sure you're committing those years of service. Yeah. yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. Most of our schools are in that category, at least in the area. So um, most students don't have a hard time doing that. But if you have a school that you you know isn't, then that's where it could be challenging. Yeah, and also if you have um, uh, any specific financial uh, financial aid pro. Uh, questions that uh, you think we didn't uh, fully answer today, just shoot us email. And if we, we couldn't give you a good answer, we will, uh, we will uh, you know, ask the financial aid people, uh, the experts there to help you. Um, myself, I don't know much about financial aid. I know the scholarships in specifically in in the STEM fields, but um, you know, the eligibility, uh, you know, and other um, opportunities I can help you with, you know, um, that and, uh, through the financial aid office. Okay, so I think that concludes our session. I will follow up with a email and so any information that Dr. Yin mentioned that she'll share, I'm sure she'll send it to me and I'll include it in the email. Um, so I have a checklist. If you don't receive it, let's say by tomorrow, feel free to email. I might have missed your name. I did go through the, um, the list as people were checking in. Feel free, though, to email if you don't receive anything, and I'll send that to you. It will include the advising form. So this is kind of a check off if you're getting ready to submit for this coming fall or spring. You should be mm -hmm. done with the session. So any questions before we check out? And thank you again, Dr. Maynard, for joining us and all of you for for checking in, we really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah. I had a quick question. Sure, go ahead. I earlier, it, so I believe it was you, so someone had said something about it's easier to transfer to, like if you want to go to another state with California credentials mm -hmm. than into California with other state, why is that? I think it's just the way California, if you look at all the investments and testing that's required. Mm -hmm. I mean, in other states we've had, teachers who've earned degrees in education go right into teaching. That's not how California is structured. And so uh, we just find students have come, when they come in to California from another state, they have to take CSETs, there's courses they may have to take to meet English learner authorizations and whatnot, uh, different from students who are leaving California to another state, unfortunately. Yeah, so there, there are some like agreements between the states so a california credential you uh, you take you can take a california credential to teach in many other states if not not all but many states that have kind of this agreement yeah okay thank you mm -hmm. i have a question Go ahead. Sure. so um if you let's say you apply for the teach grant and you also apply for the noise scholars program and you receive funding from both um once you finish with the credential program are you able to um serve as a teacher and satisfy both of those teaching requirements simultaneously um <laughs> I would have to ask that question, but I want to say that I don't know how the noise program works, but I think the teach grant does require that you have that it's a yeah, because you said the teach grant is four years in a low income school, and then the noise program is two years in the San Bernardino City Unified School mm -hmm. District. Yeah. So um, my thinking was that if I'm not mistaken, I think that's one of a low income. Yeah, yeah, school yeah. districts yeah. Yeah. so you know serving four years in that school district would satisfy the two years needed for the noise and the four years but you wouldn't have to do six years you just do four with the first yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i got your question i think we need to um maybe maybe investigate the question with the with, with the teach grant yeah yeah the funding agency, yeah, the funding agency. Yeah. yeah yeah so if you don't mind you could email that question and we can find out 
I don't want to misadvise on that. Okay, no, I, I appreciate that. I will send you an email then. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a question. Applying. There is a question. Uh, applying without CSU apply. I have already submitted an application to a master's program at CSUSB. Uh, Brad. Um, what master's program? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I applied for the uh, the computer science master's program. Oh. Uh, and it's because my end goal is to teach college at night and high school during the day. Uh, and I wasn't aware that there was a restriction of only submitting uh, one application mm. uh, per school uh, for each semester. So my I was in the process. I already was uh, uh, including my documents and everything like that. And when I submitted my other application, uh, I lost all access to uh, the CSU apply for yeah. the mm. same video. Yeah. So are you interested in applying for a credential program as well? Yeah, I am. I was hoping to pursue them both at the same time, but my priority was the uh, the single subject. Okay. If you don't mind, if you email me as well, and we'll talk to grad studies mm -hmm. to see what they can do. I know other students have done the same thing, and they seem they can do something manually. Um, so just mm -hmm. email, and we'll figure that out. Okay. Yeah, I, I had messaged them already. They they sent me a form, but uh, I haven't received much more than just that. Okay. And you've been talking to Cecilia Farmer, I would imagine? Um, so they just sent me, I'm not really sure who, uh, they sent me a form to fill out uh, like to change. apply okay. for both. I uh, wish I had the form, but I'm sorry, okay. I can't find it. Okay, um, have you submitted that form? Yeah, I did, I submitted it uh, a little bit earlier today, but okay. I haven't received any more instruction and I'm a little bit concerned about deadlines and such okay. things like that. Yeah, I think what might happen is you may have to submit an actual, uh, uh, the actual, documents by email so instead of uploading it to cal state apply i don't think they can generate a different application through cal state apply so um yeah email me because i'll get you in touch with amy thomas um or you can email both of us and we can try to see how we can have you just use the like recommendation forms i'll give you physical forms if you need to instead of using the system okay thank you mm -hmm. i have another question as well go ahead when you get accepted in the program, is it like you're automatically accepted into the classes or is it hard to get the classes when you're in the program, you know? No, we, yeah, the program will place you in a classroom. Yeah. You, you won't have any problems registering for classes. Uh, the course, we only admit as many students as we can house, so they'll open enough sections for all of our students. Now, you may not get that Monday section you wanted, you may have to get the Wednesday, um, but students get the courses they need. They'll give you a program plan, and if you stick to that program plan, the goal is to finish it within that, that time. Okay, but you're not, you're just not fighting for classes though, no. right? No. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I do have a question. If you submitted your application, do you know when you're going to be um, like getting interviewed? Like how long does it take? It's currently taking, it typically takes 10 days, but it's currently taking three to four weeks. Because of COVID-19, where our staff is only going in once a week. Okay, so three to four weeks. So that was still, when do we start? Or you start submitting your application? Or no, classes, because if it takes that long. Like, oh, okay, yeah. Well, like, if you submitted your application, uh, the sooner the better, of course. Um, the goal is July 13th is a deadline date. So hopefully by that time, we will have most of our applications already, you know, checked. And I'm sure she'll probably be working more hard to do that. Um, but it is, it's a matter of submitting as soon as possible. So they'll do the interview and then have the orientation. It is, as you're coming in later, you are coming closer to the starting date. Uh, yeah. the, the semester, that's just kind of part of. Yeah, you, and, and they're, you know, in choosing which section of classes, you have less choices. Right, and that's why I say you may not get the date you want, you'll get the course, but you might just not get the schedule you want. Yeah. Okay. No, I submitted my application already, but I hadn't heard anything yet. So um, 
the school was also waiting because they can't officially hire me unless I already been accepted into the credential oh, okay. program. So and I needed to be hired before a certain date for like the training. And I, but I'm like, I don't, I, I know that Amy had said it was going to be a while. So I wasn't sure um, if I would be um, eligible for the job if I wasn't um, accepted to the credential program yet. May I ask, is, it, is, is this an internship? No, no, it's for summer for school, but they won't hire me um, unless I have the acceptance. Like, got it, got it. If it's been more than um, three to four weeks, then feel free to email because I know that she is you, receiving so many applications right now by email and through Cal State Apply. Uh, maybe send her a little reminder um, so she can check up your application, but it should be, if, if it's not already reviewed, it's probably just pending the interview. I'll, I'll, I'll check. It hasn't been four weeks yet, so. Okay. Hopefully you'll receive something soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I know we're having a few people logging off because we're kind of going mm -hmm. over, but we're yeah. here if you have any questions. Okay. I had a question. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, with regard to like the, the letters of recommendation, um, now, do those have to be people that uh, were in like a supervisory role or a professor, or can they be someone um, that I worked with uh, in undergrad and then also um, like as a, a colleague in a professional setting? Um, or do they have to be someone who supervised me directly? So typically we ask that they either know you academically or professionally. Um, doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be within education. It's preferred, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could ask someone who actually is supervised would probably be a better option. The, the questions that they're listing on the recommendation form are not necessarily in teaching, but they do have to know how you communicate, how you, you know, read, write in certain areas and things like that. So um, I can say the recommendation form to give you an idea. Uh, it's not the right form that you're going to use. You're going to do the online uh, recommendation tab, but I can give you an idea so you know who you could ask. Yeah, that would be awesome. Should I just email you for that then? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So we're okay. Any other questions mm -hmm. before we log out? Yeah, uh, I, for any people who... Um, who are not applying immediately, I would say, um, you know, just to really be prepared to take the CSATs first, um, you know, the, all the tests and really, uh, because I know a lot of people, um, the CSAT has been a, a kind of a roadblock for many people. Yeah, so take that as early as possible. Uh, I have a question on that note with the CSAT. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, for, for instance, with the math one, there's, uh, there's three tests. In order to be admitted to the program, do you have to have completed all three exams? Or you just have to have completion of at least one? I believe it's one and two. Yeah, all right, Arena? Is that for yeah. The math CSAT. Yes. One and two. One and two. Yeah, the third one is, um, yeah, you, you, you can take the third one later. Yeah, the one to give you the foundational math. So I think it's your algebra and geometry, first one and two, and then calculus is your third. Okay, great, yeah. thank you. But with th this fall, um, you know, we're, we're taking uh, exception, we're, we're doing some exceptions. You can delay some uh, tests. <clears throat> okay, mm -hmm. I think we're good. All right. Well, thank you um, for hanging out with us. Still like about 20 yeah. of you. <laughs> this yeah. phone. So thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, joining us. And so if any questions, feel free to reach out. Mm -hmm. And so you all enjoy yeah. the rest of your evening. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Maynard. And yes. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, Arlena. Thank you.